So what have we been doing all this time looking at the pre-Socratics? Well, he first has a few words after spending, and I only read a couple of quotes here and there, after spending a big, long chapter in the pre-Socratics, he first of all wants to justify that he just did that. The fact is, these early cosmologists, he's calling the pre-Socratics cosmologists now, uh, those who studied the cosmos logically, they leapt beyond the data to the, to the intuition of universal unity. They possessed what we might call the power of metaphysical intuition. And this constitutes their glory and their claim to a place in the history of philosophy. If Thales had, contenting him, had contented himself with saying that out of water Earth has evolved, we should, as Nietzsche observes, only have a scientific hypothesis, a false one, though nevertheless difficult to refute. But Thales went beyond a mere scientific hypothesis. He reached out to a metaphysical doctrine expressed in the assertion, everything is one. Men like Anaximenes and Heraclitus took wing and flew above and beyond what could be verified by mere empirical observation. At the same time, they were not content with any mythological assumption, for they sought a real principle of unity, the ultimate substrate of change. What they asserted, they asserted in all seriousness. They had the notion of a world that was a whole, a system, a world governed by a law. Their assertions were dictated by reason or thought, not by mere imagination or mythology. And so they deserve to count as philosophers, the first philosophers of Europe. Um, this is huge, and we uh, obviously we have a different historical context, and this doesn't sound huge to us. We take for granted this type of investigation. But it was never, not only not taken for granted then, it was never done before then. He says the first of Europe because it's possible that there were some philosophers in India doing this even before, but they never really generated complete systems that we can go back on, but they deserve much credit. But anyway, um, the, uh, this type of investigation he's describing here was radically new. It was, it was generated by these pre-Socratics in Greece. We may say, therefore, that while the pre-Socratics struggled with the problem of the one and the many, they did not succeed in solving it. The Heracletian philosophy contains, indeed, the profound notion of unity and diversity, but it is bound up with an over-assertion of becoming and the difficulties consequent in the doctrine of fire. The pre-Socratics accordingly failed to solve the problem. And it was taken up again by Plato and Aristotle, who brought to bear on it their outstanding talent and genius. The early Greek philosophers were then rightly called cosmologists, for they were concerned with the nature of the cosmos, the object of our knowledge. Man himself is considered in his objective aspect as one item in the cosmos, rather than in his subjective aspect, as the subject of knowledge or as the morally willing and acting, acting subject. There's a key point, and I'm going to get to more about this in a minute. But the distinction between object and subject, first of all, that's a huge distinction throughout philosophy, Ob the objective and the subjective. Well, what on earth does that even mean? Well, grammar can inform us a little bit. What's the difference between an object pronoun and a subject pronoun? me going to give you guys a break in like 20 minutes. What's wrong with that? <laughs> Probably should have used a subject pronoun there, shouldn't I have? I am going to give you guys a break in about 20 minutes. The subjective dimension of a question is the consideration of that question in terms of the interior of man, the, the, the moral questions, the, the, the questions of meaning and purpose, the, quest, the deepest whys. They are the questions that we really want to know the answers to that really govern our lives. You can still have a philosophical investigation, a, an investigation beyond mere empirical science that deals only with the objective, and that's exactly what the pre-Socratics did. But all this time they spent dealing only with the objective, only with man as object in the cosmos, instead of, as Copleston says here, man as a morally willing and acting subject. So something was needed. Something was needed to change the very tone of philosophy. And that's exactly what we see with the emergence of the sophists. Let me hand out that discussion sheet right now.
quick note for those who are here for the first time, these discussion sheets all have an important question or two on the top. Those are the ones for you to just think about in your own, you know, after class and jot down your thoughts on and hand in those thoughts at the end of the class. As long as it adds up to five pages, that's all you need to do for your paper. Very simple. You can write on as many of them or as few of them as you want. Actually, can I give an extra one to you or a break in the back there? Hey, there I, did I print one extra, or did, did anyone not get one? You both got one back there? Okay. I don't think I changed this one at all from what was on the Google Doc, so you should be fine if you just were looking at the one on the Google Doc before. All right. So we've got a lot to talk about from this sheet but a couple more things from Copleston now to introduce the sophists. The systems, I'm reading now for part two of this book on the sophists. The systems of philosophy hitherto proposed excluded one another. There is naturally truth to be found in opposing theories, but no philosopher had yet arisen of sufficient stature to reconcile the antithesis in a higher synthesis in which error should be purged away and justice done to the truth contained in rival doctrines. I have to pause on that. And I'm going to put a couple things on the board. You don't need these down. But it's an important idea that I wouldn't want to miss in an intro fill class. And it's this idea of thesis, antithesis, synthesis. This was popularized by a philosopher by the name of Hegel. But really, it's a fairly common sense insight. And he's describing with this triad, he calls it, how the development of ideas works and how history itself works, actually, according to him. He, Hegel took his idea a little too far, as philosophers tend to do when they feel like they're onto something. Um, he thought that he could just figure out all of history and all of society with his triad and his dialectic. But anyway, the, at the essence of it, there is a good insight, and it is this. What we often see is a situation where there is thesis versus antithesis. The, the thesis, an assertion is put forth, maybe it's a movement, maybe it's an ideology, or maybe it's just a given single idea. It is put forth, and then the next thing we see as soon as it's put forth in society is what? People opposing it, the antithesis. So the thesis and the antithesis, by their very nature, are, up, are in opposition. They, as Copleston says there, they, the philosophies hitherto proposed excluded one another. You can't say Thales got everything right and Heraclitus got everything right. You can't, in fact, you can't say that with any of the two pre-Socratics. All of the systems they proposed excluded one another. So in other words, what was missing from all of that development of all the pre-Socratic era? The synthesis. What is the synthesis? The synthesis is what arises when someone of sufficient stature, as Copleston says, that there had not yet arisen a philosopher of sufficient stature. Someone who must arise of sufficient stature to look at both the thesis and the antithesis that precedes and find what is good and true in both of them discard what is false and not good in both of them, and take what remains and combine them to build a new, consistent, logically consistent, internally consistent system that is better than both of them. And this is called the synthesis. No synthesis had emerged. In all of those pre-Socratic days, no synthesis had emerged. So we've only been talking about the pre-Socratics for a couple classes now. And we're already probably sick and tired of them, which I will not begrudge anyone for. Imagine if this was the predominant conversation of your culture for a couple hundred years, at least of the intellectual milieu. Well, you could see how people would be quite fed up with it after a certain amount of time. And that's exactly what we see developing in the 400s BC. 
the result of this failure to develop a synthesis was bound to be a certain mistrust of cosmologies, and indeed a swing over to the subject as point of consideration was necessary if real advance was to be made. And that's what the sophists did. Now, I like to draw analogies, as you guys have probably discovered this point, because they make concepts not only easier to understand, but remember. And there's a perfectly analogous issue in the last century of physics. There is a major thesis antithesis in the two biggest realms of theoretical physics. One, which describes what happens on very small scales, and the other, describing what happens on very large scales. They are a thesis and an antithesis. Why? Because they have contradictions within them. They seem opposed. What are these two fields? Exactly. Relativity based, this is an oversimplification, of course, but it talks about what happens on huge scales. Quantum mechanics talking about what happens on tiny scales. They contain conflicting theories within themselves, different ways of describing the same phenomenon even, and major problems. So what are physicists doing? They're, tr they're seeking the synthesis. They are trying, there are physicists working on trying to reconcile the contradictions between quantum mechanics and relativity into the synthesis of gut. General unified theory, sometimes called a theory of everything. That being said, in this very day and age we're now living in, it's almost a mirror image of where they were at at the arisal of the Sophists in ancient Greece. I'm not saying we aren't more advanced. Obviously, we are. I'm just saying that as, um, as an author once said, who's, I, can't remember, I can't believe I can't remember the author. He wrote, uh, forget about it. I'm not going to try to remember. But he said, history might not repeat itself, but it does at least rhyme. Maybe it does repeat itself, I don't know. But the minimum, it rhymes. So if it does rhyme, it seems that we're kind of at that point today where, where they, they haven't gotten this yet. I mean, sir, there's, sir, there's uh, conjectures, there's speculations. You know, string theory is one of them, but it, it, it's pure speculation. Um, nothing's really been figured out yet. So we're kind of in a similar era now as we were at the end of the pre-Socratic era. And the question is, what's going to come next? Because people are kind of starting to I don't know, maybe despair of the physics, the physicists figuring it all out, which is probably a good despair to have, because they're not going to figure it all out. We need to ask somewhat different questions also. I mean, yes, we should continue to pursue physics, definitely, don't get me wrong, but we also need to ask different types of questions and try and put our hope in answering more questions than just what's the smallest particle, the Higgs boson or the gluon. Um, and you know, you can kind of tell what someone places their hope in by how much money they put behind various things. And as I mentioned last class, I think, the, uh, I suppose you could say, yeah, it makes sense that a philosophy professor would complain about this, but I'll do it anyway. That 99.6% of higher education funding goes to STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. I think we're just hoping for a little more out of it than it can give. That's just me, though. Feel free to disagree. Um, so we're trying to get the gut. We're trying to get the general unified theory. I hope we get it. Don't get me wrong. But they certainly didn't get it in the pre-Socratic era. So Coppelson says there was a certain mistrust of cosmologies. People got fed up with this constant speculation as to what the Aristotle was. And they were ready to hear the words of somebody who had a radically different message. And that somebody, those somebodies, were the sophists. It was Plato's consideration, I'm reading from Coppelson now, of thought that made possible a truer theory in which justice should be done to the facts of both stability and mutability. But the reaction from object to subject, which made possible with the advance, first appears among the sophists and was largely an effect of the bankruptcy of the older Greek philosophy. So after all his praise that he's been lavishing on the pre-Socratics, rightfully so, he admits at the end of the day that it was kind of bankrupt. Didn't really deliver on what it was attempting to deliver on. In the face of the dialectic of Zeno, it might even appear doubtful if advance in that study of cosmology was really possible, he even admits. So in come the sophists. The sophists, I'm going to put it bluntly, because it's easier to remember blunt things, are kind of 
like the bad guys of ancient Greek philosophy, unfortunately. But we thank them enormously for their contribution of changing the dialogue. They were the ones who were able to change the main discourse of the day from this incessant speculation on what the Aristotle is to man himself. And that is Protagoras' most famous saying, man is the measure of all things. Basically, he didn't care about anything but our wants, human needs and wants. And there are major problems in that, as we'll see shortly. But still, it was only because of this huge wave of sophist, uh, sophistical writings and, and speeches and arguments that people started considering these questions that were more about the subjective dimension of man instead of just the objective dimension of the cosmos. And that was actually what made real, real helpful philosophy of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle possible. Socrates was a dialoguer. As you guys know, he's talking to people all the time. Well, if, if all people ever wanted to do was talk about whether everything's a fire or water, we never would have had a Socrates, because he didn't care if everything was fire or if everything was water. Just like I don't care if everything's gluons or Higgs bosons. Not that I'm many Socrates, but um, thanks to the sophists and their bad arguments, the conversations that needed to happen could finally happen. And without the sophists, there couldn't have been a Socrates. It's kind of like those superhero movies. There was some superhero, Unbreakable, I think was the name. Has anyone seen Unbreakable? Bruce Willis? I'm going to botch this because I saw it so long I can barely remember it. It's not a real superhero movie, but it's like a, it's kind of philosophical almost. There's the arch villain of this movie, close your ears if you don't want the end given away, is um, actually the one who's kind of a good guy, but with twisted with a twisted philosophy of his own, he wants to find the hero of the day. He knows there's some hero out there, but that the hero of the day had not yet arisen because the conflict that would call his mission into existence had not yet happened. So he, he works behind the scenes to fabricate these disasters and horrible events, knowing that in one of them this destined hero is going to arise. Well. We should never uh, play God like that, certainly. But still, the point is the same. The Sophists were those catastrophes that called into being the mission of Socrates. So they weren't entirely catastrophic. They had valid points, as everybody does. But they also had invalid ones. OK, what was their approach? Well, Cobbleston says here, the older Greek philosophy, meaning the philosophy of the pre-Socratics, by no means excluded empirical observation, but it was characteristically deductive. When a philosopher had settled on his general principle of the world, its ultimate constituent principle, it then remained to explain particular phenomena in accordance with that principle. The sophist, however, sought to amass a wide store of particular observations and facts. They were encyclopedists, polymaths. Then from these accumulated facts, they proceeded to draw conclusions, partly theoretical, partly practical. Thus, from that store of facts they accumulated concerning the differences of opinion and belief, they might draw conclusions. Um, this gets to the distinction between two types of reasoning. And you don't need this down either, but I'll run through it real quick before giving you stuff you will want to have down. We have the method of the pre-Socratics, deductive. They come up with an idea, and they apply logic to that idea, that principle, to try and explain other things in accordance with it. Geometry is deductive. You have a couple axioms, you apply logic to those, and you can deduce the entire field of geometry from that. But what other kind of reasoning do we also have? That, what's that? Inductive, exactly. Just as important, don't get me wrong, but if you focus only on inductive or deductive, you're going to miss many important things. In inductive reasoning, you pile up as much relevant information as you can, and you kind of hope that it generally points in one direction to a given conclusion or another. This is certainly what's done in you know, court cases. You want as much relevant evidence as possible, hoping that once it's all compiled well, 
it will point beyond reasonable doubt to one conclusion or another. Um, deductive methods have their benefits, inductive methods have their benefits, there's a reason we have both because we need them both. But we have to be careful not to suppose that one can do the job of the other. Um, when you go to a doctor, you want, you don't, I hope, you don't want to go to some doctor who says, oh, I, I have this idea of what, like, health looks like, and it's, it's got all these vibrations and energy, and I, I just, I just come up with, with treatments for people's issues based on this idea I have of health. That's not going to cure you very well. You want a doctor who's gone to med school, has seen this disease before, knows all the medicines, knows the studies, knows the... In other words, you want a doctor who's got a lot of inductive experience behind him, right? Hopefully. Um, the FDA, when they approve a medicine, they don't just say, oh, we've, we've got this idea as to what the geometric configuration of a good medicine molecule looks like, and we're going to look at whether this one lines up with this geometric configuration. No, they do what? Tests and tests and tests and tests. Maybe too many, maybe too few. I don't know. But they do a lot of tests, and they hope that compiling enough relevant data is going to point in one direction or another, safe or unsafe medicine. I'm sure there's plenty of criticisms you could levy against them, but they are at least, I think we can agree, right in this inductive approach of compiling as much relevant information as possible. But here's the problem with inductive. When you go about supposing that you can just compile all sorts of facts, and this is what the sophists did. They were travelers. They traveled all over the place. They memorized all sorts of stuff. They met all sorts of people. And basically, they presented this image of themselves as really cool, really learned, scholarly people that just had all these experiences behind them, and they knew all this stuff. So basically, because they know all this stuff, you just have to believe what they say. They're not going to waste much time with deduction, because in deduction, someone listening to you can actually follow your reasoning. And if someone can follow your reasoning, he can do what or what with the conclusion presented. Yeah, he could contradict it. He could be well, you could be well within your rights to contradict a conclusion arrived at by deductive reasoning if you see a what or a what. A fallacy or a flawed premise. The sophists don't want you to spot a fallacy or a flawed premise. Why? Because they know that they are not arguing for the truth. They know they're not. Anyway, we're going to see more on their motivation as I continue on here. And I'm going to make sure to stay true to my word of giving you guys a break before an hour and a half. But let me see if I can quickly polish off this intro to the sophists before that. Um, the the reason that the sophists, in turn, were able to really explode onto the scene was because of what was happening historically in ancient Greece of that time. What else, not just was philosophy born, what else was born in the Western world in ancient Greece at about this time? A certain system we take for granted today, democracy. Athens is famous for being the birthplace of Western democracy. Um, and we all love democracy, maybe, but I hope that at least we're starting to get wise enough today to realize that democracy is not the panacea. Panacea is a cure-all. Uh, don't, uh, don't get me wrong, I'm a big fan of democracy, but um, it is a tool, right? And like any other tool, it is as good as it is useful. Does, do does democracy guarantee that justice will reign in society? <laughs> no. Democracy is a system that allows the will of the people to govern. And that begs the question, what is the will of the people? Is it good or not? If it's not good, democracy is not going to give anything good. So anyway, what more specific dangers are inherent in the nature of democracy? What's maybe some, a couple of the biggest, at least? Yeah, and, and if that gets ugly, it can, be, it, it can devolve from a just rule of the people to something that's called blank rule. Yeah, it can become tyrannical eventually. We'll see that in Plato. Uh, mob rule. 
uh, democracy can descend into mob rule. But also, there's a danger in democracy, and again, I'm not saying this is intrinsic, like, I'm not saying we should abandon democracy because of this, I'm just saying these are dangers. Um, and there were very evident dangers in ancient Greece as well, where having a certain something can inor get you inordinate amounts of power. Having this, a certain skill can get you an inordinate amount of power in a democracy. Rhetoric, persuasion. If you had the art of persuasion, and you could teach this art of persuasion to others, you could have immense power. And we're more on guard from against that today because democracy has been around for a while, but this was so new in ancient Greece that the mere power to persuade could make you practically a ruler overnight. And that's exactly what these sophists had. They had this incredible power of persuasion. And they knew they did. And because they lived in a democracy, they realized that they could sell their powers of persuasion to the highest bidder. They were all about making money off of their rhetoric. Because there are many people who will bid very highly for this power of persuasion in a democracy. People who want what or what? People who want laws made in accordance with their own whims, and people who want lawsuits won probably unjustly. Why do you think some lawyers today are able to make $700 an hour? Because they have this knack for persuading a jury, and they get a reputation for that. And if a celebrity or some rich person gets charged with something, they're not going to go to the public defender, are they? They're going to hire a seven hundred dollar an hour lawyer, just like this is a they. What they realize now, they realized back then in ancient Greece, the sophists could become incredibly rich by selling their persuasive powers, and that's exactly what they did. But here's the problem: right and wrong really gets in the way of make, like having a conscience and believing in right and wrong and truth and error and wishing to conform your life in accordance with that. That really gets in the way of making as much money as possible, doesn't it? And the sophists were well aware of that. So they didn't want to be chained by these truths. They didn't want to have these, these uh, philosophical notions of truth and goodness restraining their ability to make as much money as possible by condemning the innocent, vindicating the guilty, and getting whatever law passed the highest bidder wanted to get passed. The original lobbyists, lawyers, or the sophists. Um, not that I have anything against those people uh, in and of themselves. It's obviously just a matter of when they succumb to unjust methods. Anyway, Copleston points out here, if a man wanted to make money in a Greek democracy, it had to be done mainly by lawsuits, and the sophists professed to teach the right way of winning these lawsuits. In practice, this clearly meant the art of teaching men how to make the unjust cause appear to be the just one. And such a, such a procedure was obviously very different from the procedure of truth-seeking attitude of the philosophers. Um, so here's the thing. Although they are not strictly speaking philosophers, they do have a philosophy because everybody has a philosophy. At the very minimum, everybody has at least some sort of a pseudo-philosophy, a rationalization that they can present at the drop of a hat to supposedly justify doing what they do. Even if they haven't put a bunch of thought into it, even if they haven't really written huge books on it, maybe, they can still usually have something to say when they are reproached for doing what they know they shouldn't be doing. They have something to say in response. Um, and the ironic thing about what they had to say was that although they didn't call themselves philosophers, many of them were just fine with the title sophist. How does that sound familiar? How, how does that sound similar? Philosopher is a what? A lover of wisdom. Philosophy, philosophy, a lover of wisdom. So what do you think the etymology of sophist means then? There's no philo in there. There's just, there's just the wisdom part. In other words, a sophist is not one who claims, someone who calls himself a sophist is not claiming to love wisdom, he's claiming to what? To already have it. 
As we'll see when we move into the Socrates unit, Socrates' whole irony is that he does not believe he is wise. He loves wisdom, he wants wisdom, but he doesn't believe he has it. The sophist is one who claims that he already has wisdom. And in the ultimate irony, those are always precisely the least wise of all. And that indeed was the case with the sophists themselves. So these, these supposed wise men, and by the way, throughout our readings, they'll sometimes be referred to as sophists, sometimes as rhetors, sometimes as orators, um, sometimes as teachers of aristic, the teachers of persuasion. This is all a reference to the same group of people. So what was their pseudo-philosophy? What is something that some people might think is new, but is not new, it's 2,500 years old. It's a certain pseudo-philosophy that says, conveniently, we don't need to worry about the demands that truth places on us. We don't need to worry that we are vindicating the guilty and condemning the innocent in contradiction to the truth because there isn't a truth. There is no truth. How convenient for a sophist. That is relativism. That is the simplest definition of relativism. Now they do have some arguments for this and, and they deserve to be considered. But I want to read, just here in a couple minutes before we take our break, I want to read an excerpt from an individual work of an individual sophist, Gorgias. The Gorgias dialogue you guys read for today, the, the sections I had you read, Gorgias himself was not even a part of it. Um, but Gorgias was a real person. He was a sophist, one of the greatest of them, one of the most well-renowned, I should say. Not a terrible person in some senses. He was more dignified than Calicles in the dialogue. But um, he, we're going to talk about his famous denials after the break. And his work his words trying to prove uh, this general relativistic premise it typifies, it is the quintessential example of sophism. This is only going to take me like a minute or two to read, but you're going to really want to take a break when I'm done reading this. Gorgias says he wants to prove that there is no existence. He said he wants to prove that nothing exists, that nothing has being. He says, something with being does not have being. For if something with being has being, it must be either eternal or created or both eternal and created. But it is neither eternal nor created nor both, as we will show. And from this it follows that something with being does not have being. If it is eternal, taking this proposition first, it has no beginning. Because anything created has a beginning. But qua uncreated something, that is something as uncreated, is eternal and thus has no beginning, since it is, since it is, has no beginning, it is infinite. Since it is infinite, it is nowhere. Because if it is somewhere, then that which it is, is different from it. And so something with being will no longer be infinite, given that it is contained within something, for the container is greater than the contained. But there is nothing greater than what is infinite, which means that something infinite cannot be anywhere, but neither is it contained within itself. For if this is so, the container and the contained will be identical. And a thing with being will become two, both place and body, the container being place and the contained being body. But this is absurd. And therefore, some Something with being is not within itself either. The outcome of all this is that if something with being is eternal, it is infinite. And if it is infinite, it is nowhere. And if it is nowhere, then it has no being. And so if something with being is eternal, it has no being at all. You guys followed all that, right? You followed each step of that process. <laughs> You're not supposed to follow it. It's sophism. You're supposed to what? You're supposed to not understand it. You're su I, I know that none of you guys are going to fall for this, but the hope of a sophist is this lofty-sounding speech dragged on for long enough with enough big words given in an authoritative air by an authoritative speaker. It doesn't need to be true. It doesn't need to be logical. It doesn't need to be reasonable. But at the end of it, you'll just agree with the conclusion presented because of how it's been presented and because you didn't follow the argument. That is the goal of sophism. It is precisely that, to have you buy a conclusion 
that isn't true because you're not supposed to follow the argument. Now, you guys might have realized at this point in reading the dialogue that Socrates can sometimes be painstakingly, almost uh, incredibly annoyingly zealous to go back and forth with the person he's speaking with to make absolutely sure the person he's speaking with is with him every step of the way because Socrates is not ideological. He doesn't want you to just buy his conclusion because it's him saying it. He desperately wants truth, and he wants to be shown that he's wrong if he is wrong, but if he's right, he wants to help the person he's speaking with see that. So hence the, this constant back and forth that Socrates engages in. Um, that's not what a sophist does. A sophist wants you to be wooed, seduced, into just going with whatever he says. That's how sophism operates. And relativism and subjectivism are the philosophies or the pseudo-philosophies that they use to justify it. So we'll have to talk about those after a well-deserved break. So we've been uh, talking about the man Gorgias, because he was one of the most well-known sophists, but he was not the first of the sophists. The first was Protagoras. And let's, everyone has this sheet, right? Yeah, I just handed it out. Uh, Protagoras, born in uh, 490, BC. Now, it's a, I don't insist upon memorizing dates. I don't insist upon memorizing anything, but uh, it's a good thing to remember, if you can, that Socrates died in 399 BC. Easy day to remember. So, that's, it's just good to remember because you can, you can have in mind who it is possible for Socrates to have interacted with based upon when they lived. So, he died at 70, and he Let's round that to 400, so he would have been born around 470. So Protagoras was a bit older than Socrates, and there are some dialogues with Protagoras himself in them. Not as interesting as the Gorgias, though. Uh, Protagoras, it says here, thought that for every argument in favor of a proposition, there's another argument for the opposite statement. He taught his students how to make the apparently weaker argument look stronger. Plato objected to this and grounds that such a procedure teaches people to win a victory in a debate, but not how to discover truth. A student in my just last class put it well uh, in a quote that he heard, that one should argue for the truth, not for being right. Hopefully those are the same thing, but they're not the same thing if you aren't uh, actually correct in your conviction to begin with. Having the willingness to change one's view throughout a discourse is one of the greatest virtues. It is the virtue of intellectual humility, which we'll talk about more when we get to the Socrates unit. Uh, and Socrates himself didn't merely preach it, he had it. There are actual dialogues where Socrates changes his mind in the middle of them. So you can't claim that he's just insisting that other people be humble so that he can convince them of things. Anyway, let's take a look at a couple things Protagoras said here. Protagoras said that man is the measure of all things. This is a quote from Aristotle's work where he's talking uh, about Protagoras. By which he meant that any impression a person receives is also securely true. From this it follows, this is Aristotle saying, from Protagoras' view it follows that the same thing both is and is not the case, and is bad and good, and all other contradictories. Because it often happens that something can appear beautiful to one lot of people and the opposite to another lot. But on Protagoras' view, it is what it appears to anyone, and that is the measure. Um, so man is the measure of all things is his most famous statement. As with most fairly vague proverbs can be interpreted in an almost infinite number of ways. And there are plenty of interpretations of that that are good. For example, such an attitude is, as I said before the break, precisely what enabled Greek philosophy to turn from endless speculation about the nature of the cosmos to thinking about things that will actually help us, like uh, our lives. Yes. Philosophy should be useful. Sure, it's for its own sake, but yeah, it should also be useful. And it's really not particularly useful to know whether everything is fire, whether everything is water. Um, because first of all, it's neither. But anyway, the, um, but that's probably not what Protagoras meant by this. He didn't merely mean, in other words, you can't really say that Protagoras was merely espousing a primitive humanism. You know, humanism 
the movement that tries to make human concerns central to our efforts, so on and so forth. Uh, that would be a noble interpretation of Protagoras, but what he's really saying, and I think we can confidently say that Aristotle, living only decades after Protagoras, knew better than us living thousands of years after Protagoras, what Protagoras meant, was that he's denying the, that what is the measure of all things. Truth, reality. Like he's, a measure is supposed to be of the thing you're measuring. When you measure something, you want to actually, just to take a mundane example, literal measurement. When you measure something, it's because you want to know how long it actually is. Not because you want to just decide how long it is in accordance with your whims. You want to actually know. So he's simply, by, by saying that man, man, human, I don't believe in editing historical documents. They say man, that means human people. Um, he says man is the measure of all things. He means whatever we want, that's how it is, because there isn't a truth anyway. So this is where he's espousing relativism. Man is the measure of all things is his definition of relativism. But that's certainly what he's espousing, as, as Aristotle says here. And you probably already have down a simple definition for relativism. We can stick with that simple one, that there is no truth. Um, but let's take a look at Protagoras' own words. He deserves as much. He says, I know of plenty of things which are harmful to people. They may be foods or drinks or drugs or whatever, and others which are beneficial. I know of things which are neither harmful nor beneficial to people, but are to horses, or only to cattle, or only to dogs. And then there are things which are neither harmful nor beneficial for any of these creatures, but are for trees, and things which are good for the roots of trees, but bad for their shoots, such as manure, which is good for all plants when applied to their roots, but deadly if it put on the shoots and the young branches. Or then there's olive oil, which is completely pernicious for all plants and ruins the hair of all non-human creatures, but it is good for human hair, and for the rest of their body too. Goodness is so diverse and varied that even in our case, one and the same thing may be good for the outside of the human body, but awful for the inside. All right, what's his argument? There are good and bad things, not necessarily some things that are good for one thing, but not good for another. Right, and this is quintessential sophism as well. It's not as lofty as Gorgias's, but he's listing, he's doing what induction? He's listing all sorts of examples hoping we don't realize that all of the examples he provides are what? Physical things. We all already know that physical things are neither good nor bad. The question of goodness or badness applies to moral acts, which can be good or bad. Um, so it's, it's called a straw man, actually. A straw man is the, where you set up a very weak argument and then destroy it. But that wasn't anybody's argument in the first place. It just made you look strong that you tackled a straw man, hence the name of the fallacy. Anyway, um, he's saying that everything is gray, in, in other words. And certainly many things are gray. Remember, relativism, to not be a relativist doesn't mean you're saying you think everything is black and white. Everybody knows that some things are gray and that some things are mere preference and some things are mere opinion. You know, I don't know of anybody, any serious person who engages in a debate on whether sausage or pepperoni pizza tastes better. Why? It's just obviously a matter of preference. It's obviously not something that has an objective truth uh, pertaining to it, and there is no legitimate answer to that other than to each his own. We all know it would be a waste of time to, we can talk about our preferences, certainly, but we all know it would be a waste of time to enter into a, an attempt at a logical discourse trying to, under, uh, to discover the truth as to which is objectively a superior tasting pizza topping. Um, and the, uh, the way you'll hear it often said is everything is gray. And yes, so yes, many things are gray, no one denies that. But the relativist is the one saying everything is gray. There is no black, there is no white, there is only gray. And that's what Protagoras is saying here. Um, you can list gray things for the rest of your life, and that doesn't prove that there aren't black things and there aren't white things. It just proves that you found a bunch of gray things. But I think that the analogy of grayness is perfectly chosen, because some things are truly gray, but it just so happens that the room we're in now presents a good example, although I don't, at least my table up here does. I don't know, each of these desks looks a little different. But if you look closely, okay, look at a distance at your desk. It's what color? Gray. 
But if you look closely, and I don't know if this will work. I only know that my table does. What do you, what do you see if you look closely enough at it? Yeah, there's all sorts of other things in there. I don't know if this, if your desk will work for the illustration I'm making, but if I look at my table up here, I very clearly see white and black. But I can't if I'm looking at it from here. I just see a gray table. So what's my point in this? That the view is necessary, that sometimes a view that seeing black and white requires what? Yeah, close enough perspective. Sometimes, usually when you say it's gray, you might be right, but it's because the question is too broad. And usually people ask these broad questions. Is, is blank right? And they put some incredibly broad thing in the, blank, in the blank there, which sometimes is right and sometimes is wrong. But that hasn't proved that everything is gray. Just, you just didn't ask a specific enough question. Um, you know, the quintessential question is, is killing wrong? Well, not if what? Yeah, not if it's inevitable. Is that what you said? Uh, did I mishear you? Oh, if it's an animal, okay, yeah. If it's an animal, I'm, I, I personally enjoy hamburgers. Um, if it's self-defense, most of us would be, I think, okay with if there was no possible other way to save the innocent to... If someone walks in here with a with a gun and then starts shooting us up, then yeah, if, if killing him is the only way we can that we can stop that, then I think we'd all agree that's fine. Um, but you know, directly and intentionally murdering an innocent human being—that's pretty obviously wrong. So we look at things a little more closely. We look at things that at first glance appear gray, and usually, I shouldn't say usually, but many times you look at them closely enough, and just as I'm seeing in this table, black and white, so too you analyze a question closely enough. And you will see black and white in there. Um, but you got to look closely and carefully. In other words, the right answer to most overly general questions is the answer you've all heard, probably your parents give many times when you ask questions when you were a kid. It's just two words. It depends. Exactly. It depends. It does. It, just, it depends. It's, your parents, when you hear that as an answer, the person isn't saying there is no truth. The person is not saying it's whatever you want it to be. The person is saying, you need more information to, de to determine whether uh, the objectively true answer is this or this. And if we had more information, then yes, we could give an objectively true answer. So some things are, it does not follow from the assertion that some things are gray, that all things are gray. But anyway, I want to take a, a, a better look at this, a closer look at this proposition of relativism, because it's kind of important, before we dive really deeply into philosophy, to believe there is a truth. Because if there's not a truth, philosophy is completely and utterly pointless. And we don't need philosophers. If there's no truth, we don't need philosophers. We just need bolsters. We just need more people figuring out what everybody believes, and then just do that no matter what. Um, so there is no truth. Let's take a look at that phrase again. There's plenty of other ways of defining relativism, but let's take a look at the very simplest one for now. And remember, I'm not saying that nothing is relative. The point here of opposing relativism is just a, to oppose the assertion that absolutely everything is merely relative and nothing more. All right, first thing I want to do is draw a meter. That's a meter, maybe. Suppose. Uh, so somebody here has a better eye for a meter than I do. You could validly, I mean, you would be with, well within your intellectual rights to say, I just don't think that's a meter. Why are you intellectually, logically justified in contradicting my meter? There's what? Yeah, so I certainly haven't argued well that my meter is, is a meter. That's, that's true. If, I, if you said, no, that's not a meter, and I said, actually, yeah, that's a meter, what, what could we do? We could measure it. Somebody could whip out a measuring tape, and we could go at it. But here's the problem. What if I said, um, you know what? I'm going to go with my meter. I prefer my meter to your measuring tape. What could we do next? Could we do anything next? 
it would be expensive. But there is some there's there is still recourse. And don't worry, I'm getting I'm getting to a point here in a moment. But even if I mean there would obviously be more things we'd do for like we take out other measuring sticks and we we but I could theoretically continue to insist that my meter is the meter and all these all these all these measuring tapes don't know what they're talking about. And, but there is at least one thing you could do that would absolutely settle the matter. There's one thing we could do to 100% settle whether or not this is a meter. Well, that certainly, we could look up the definition, but that alone would not do it, because then we'd have to buy a plane ticket, go to Paris, why Paris? Exactly. We need to buy a lot of cargo space in the plane because we need to take this chalkboard with us. But we could take this chalkboard with us, get on a plane, go to Paris, to a suburb of, to a specific suburb of Paris that I can't remember the name of. And um, we could go to a certain building there where there is a vacuum chamber. And within that vacuum chamber, there is a platinum iridium alloy rod. And what is that platinum iridium alloy rod? The meter. And if we compared my meter to that meter and found a difference, I could no longer argue that my meter is the meter. So what if you argue that the meter is not the meter? You couldn't, because it is the meter. <laughs> it was, that's the thing. That's where the buck stops. And only because the bucks, if, it, but you're, let, me, let me continue with that. I'm glad you bring that up. If there wasn't the meter, we couldn't argue about this in the first place. Because eventually we could just get to the point where you said, where we could just say, nope, there isn't, that's not. If there wasn't somewhere where the buck stops, if there wasn't the meter, then even now, even here in Troy, New York, we could not argue about whether or not this is a meter if there wasn't somewhere the meter. Ontologically, uh, causally, logically, philosophically, metaphysically, it is the existence of the meter somewhere that enables a logical discourse about whether a given meter is a meter to occur. It, it, it is what enables all such discourses to not be exercises in futility, which they would be if there was no the meter. Because if there was no the meter, then meters would be whatever you want them to be. Um, you could identify whatever you please as a meter. But we can't, because there is the meter. Uh, now, just so I don't mislead anyone, I should point out that technically the, the meter changed in 1960, then again in 1983. So throw out all your meter sticks uh, manufactured before then, because I'm sure you have them all kicking around. Uh, no, it, it did change, but not significantly. Um, we now, we still have that same platinum iridium alloy rod. but. It's, morally, it's more for historical purposes now. The meter still exists, but it's not a specific rod now. It's a specific equation. The meter is now defined as a certain fraction of the speed of light, which actually, that approach has its own methodological, philosophical problems, which I shouldn't even try to dive into right now. But anyway, that's how we do it today. Just so you know, there's still the meter, but it's defined as a certain fraction of the speed of light. So the existence of the meter is still what enables us to debate about whether a given meter is a meter. It just changes, practically speaking, how we go about settling the debate. We would need to measure the speed of light here and determine what fraction of it uh, takes up how much space in this chalkboard, which would actually be a lot harder than just flying to Paris. So I, I still am kind of wondering if we should have just stuck with the platinum iridium alloy rod. But anyway, I digress. Um, what am I getting at here? Here's what I'm getting at. And this is one way we could address relativism by just pointing this out. All argumentation presupposes the existence of truth. If there were no truth, there would be absolutely no reason to argue about anything because there wouldn't be any matters to settle because there is nothing to do the settling. 
Now, I'm not, this actually has not disproven relativism. All, of, all that I've done by writing this down is pointed out that if you're going to ever argue, don't try to say you're a relativist because you're not. Or maybe you're just hypocritical. Someone who is a hardcore relativist has absolutely no right to argue about anything. And if he does, he's proven he doesn't believe his own words. Um, and by argue, I mean that in the proper sense of the word, like logical discourse. The existence of logical discourse requires the existence of the truth that grounds logical discourse, that logical discourse at least tries to arrive at, even if it doesn't always succeed. It's at least trying. It would be kind of like a basketball game cannot occur if there is not a what. Like that's a number of things, but certainly a, certainly a hoop, right? Because you can't, I mean, an actual, an actual uh, game that can be won. Because the only way you can know who wins a basketball game is by who gets more baskets. And the only way you can get baskets is if there's a hoop to score points, score baskets in. If there's not even something to direct the effort at, the effort itself, if it's ever engaged in, is obviously futile. No one, I think, would waste time trying to really win a basketball game if there was no basketball hoop. Likewise, no one who rejects the existence of truth would waste any time with a logical argument because there is nothing to direct a logical argument at. And many people become de facto relativists when they, just when they, um, dismiss logical attempts to resolve conflict and instead defer to what? What's that? Sorry. Yeah, how? OK, so here's the thing. Real no one can deny that there are conflicts. There are disagreements. There's, there are clashes. There are contradictions of interests. There are fundamentally two ways of settling any such situation. What are the two fundamental ways? Oh. OK, that's, that's interesting. That, that's one way we could categorize the two ways. I hadn't thought about that. What's another way we could cat? So there's, there's conflicting claims to a given thing. There are two ways we can try to settle which claim is granted. And now, now I'm actually just getting politically, like this in, in, in international relations, see, we can do what or we can do what? We can fight or we can talk. And if we're going to talk, what we're trying to do is figure out what is good and what is true and what is just in an attempt to align what is done with what we thereby discover. Conflict, fighting, I should say, is what ensues when we abandon those attempts. The single biggest thing that relativism does is it causes violence. Because there will always be conflicts that need to be resolved. And we can resolve them by trying to resolve them in accordance with what is true and good and just. Or we can resolve them by seeing who has bigger guns. Uh, so it's very sad that we unfortunately choose the latter more often than the former today. Because uh, there's a great quote. War doesn't determine who's right, only you're both right, but this is even more poetic. War does not determine who's right, only who's left. Not meaning, but like who's still there, like who's left. And that doesn't prove anything, just who survives a fight. Uh, that's a very lame way of settling things. Anyway. All argumentation presupposes the existence of truth. And the argumentation doesn't always go very well, unfortunately. But any, even if it's something as minimal as a Twitter back and forth or a, com or a combox battle of intellects, the people only bother to engage in that because they both presuppose the existence of a truth that they hope to convince the other of. Or maybe they're being more honest and just sincerely dialoguing with the other in hopes of finding that truth with the other, which is a much better way than simply debating. OK, but there's a much better way to address relativism. Than, I think this is the easiest to remember, so I, and it's, it's useful. But it's not technically a refutation of relativism, because someone could be a relativist and say, OK, I'll just won't logically discourse about anything. I just won't argue then. And I, then, the, then this wouldn't work. Um, 
here's, a, here, here's another way we can look at this. And it has to do with this statement that I'm going to write in the board. Some of you have seen this before, I'm sure. What's the deal? What's the problem? So it's false. So it's, I guess, assuming that there's something beforehand that's false. Yeah. But there's nothing there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. Just why does this make your head want to explode? It's paradoxical. It's if it's what it's what, and if it's what it's what. If so, so it's false, right? Because it says it's false, meaning it's what. True. True. Um, but so it's true, that means it's not false. So I guess it isn't false, but it's false. You get the point. This is called the liar paradox. Careers have been wasted analyzing this stupid thing. <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous. But anyway, I hope I, I intend to address it in about three minutes here. And I'm not saying I, I'm, I'm going to settle the matter or anything. I'm sure there's more, much more to be said. I do think it's a waste to dedicate a career to this statement, but anyway, we'll, we'll dedicate a few minutes to it at least. Um, a student a few years ago gave me a book, and this was its title. This statement is false, and there are all sorts of different takes on it. But I think the easiest, simplest, not that I would want to do anything just because it's easy or simple, but, also, but because it's true. You know, some of you have probably heard of Occam's razor. What is Occam's razor? Occam's razor is, is the principle where the simplest explanation is the best. Problem is, there's no proof for Occam's razor. It just kind of feels right. And often it's true, but it's not necessarily true. I digress. This statement is false. All right. Let's try and figure out what's going on here. It's obviously a paradox. Can I walk into real quick? All right. So 2 plus 2 equals 4, and. Here's statement one, and here's statement two. You don't need any of this down. Two plus two equals four, and it is true that two plus two equals four. I wager, this is my, this is, the, this is how I would deal with this paradox, and uh, I know some people disagree with me, and that's fine, but just see how this sits with you. I wager that statement one and statement two are not substantially logically different. Um, obviously, they look different. Obviously, statement two is longer. Obviously, they are phrased differently. But I wager that they are not fundamentally different. Why? Because the operation of anything whatsoever always presupposes that it is done in accordance with its nature. What is the nature of communication? To convey truth, to put truth from one mind into another. That's the nature of communication. We have all these separate minds. We cannot, uh, we, we don't have access to telepathy, so we communicate to get the truth from our mind to the truth of somebody else's mind. What is presupposed in the nature of a thing doesn't need to be explicitly stated for it to nevertheless be so. In other words, every single thing you say is preceded by what? It is true that. You don't bother saying it is true that before every single thing you say because that would double the length of every conversation you have. And that would be ridiculous. You don't need to say it is true that before every single thing you say. It just is. Now, you might understandably protest, hold on, there's such a thing as a lie. Yes, there is. Of course, there is a lie. We are beings with free will, and we can choose, unfortunately, if we can, I mean, free will is our greatest gift, but we can choose to abuse that and contradict the nature of things in our choices. But contradicting the nature of a thing does not change its nature. Uh, chopping off one of your fingers does not change the fact that a human hand is a five-fingered thing by nature. 
So yes, people lie, but that doesn't change the nature of communication. They've just perverted it. Um, which is why a lie is one of the worst things you can do in philosophy. It's also one of the, Buddhism considers it one of the worst things you can do as well, to lie, anyway. Um, what am I getting at here? Well, every single statement can be assumed to be preceded by, it is true that. This statement too could be preceded by, it is true that, or identically, this statement is true. It is true that is the same thing as saying, this statement is true, colon. Here's the statement. So I could have just written, this statement is true, this statement is false. In other words, I could also write square triangle. And yet, for some reason, nobody's head explodes when I write square triangle. Because mathematics has that ability to give great illustrations to philosophy. It's just a contradiction. It's all sorts of contradictions. An odd, even integer, square triangle, um, the, something being and not being at the same time in the same aspect. Just because contradictions can be stated doesn't really mean anything. So, back to our there is no truth. There is no truth is a statement that can simply be restated as what? <laughs> What could I put in that blank? It is true that. In other words, to assert relativism is always to assert what? A contradiction. To assert there is no truth is to attempt to assert a truth. It is always intrinsically contradictory to even define relativism. Um, and there's no way out of it. I had a long back and forth with a physics professor once who was flirting with relativism, and he said, okay, but what if I say there is only one truth and this is it? Interesting. He was, he was fascinating, but what's the problem with that? Did he find a way to define relativism and to assert it validly? Did he also miss something? By the way, if I'm still droning on when it hits nine, make sure I'm not, because i got to give you the quiz by then so that I can stay true to my word of letting you guys out early. Um, to say there is only one truth and this is it is to assert how many truths? Two, at least two, maybe more. Because it's to first of all say that there is only one truth, and it's to say this is that only one truth. That's two separate truth assertions. It's just as intrinsically contradictory as this. We can't, um, we can't categorically reject truth. To, to insist that all things are mere opinion is to assert something more than mere opinion. All of the worst philosophies fail to apply their own tenets to their own premises. Relativism is the example par excellence of precisely that. Um, not that it's even worthy of the name philosophy. It is certainly a pseudo-philosophy. So what simply could we have down here? Right, we already have down that all argumentation presupposes the existence of truth. Um, but maybe we can also have down something to this effect. Quote, there is no truth. or any variation on that. There is no truth or any variation on that is always intrinsically contradictory. Intrinsically meaning what? Exactly. Like, it doesn't need anything outside. The contradiction exists within its very self, not in as much as it contradicts some other external assertion. Something that's intrinsically contradictory can be immediately rejected. Something that uh, is externally contradictory is only rejected if it contradicts something else that has itself been determined to be true. Then, indeed, it must be rejected, but only if so. Okay. 
Now, there's not too many hardcore relativists, um, but still, it's an important mini discussion to have before diving into philosophy. Philosophy being the love of wisdom, wisdom being an understanding of the truth and a willingness to live in accordance with it and strive to discover it. So there is no philosophy if there is no truth. There's no science if there's no truth either. And let's see, can I erase this? I'll leave the bottom. I assume everyone has the top part down already. And I'll leave this a little longer. Okay, the three denials of Gorgias. This is interesting. Gorgias, I already read the quote, part of his treatise, part of his speech, I should say. They didn't so much write as they did speak, because that's how they could really exercise their persuasive powers. Um, it, it was not just about the content of what they said, it was, it was this whole act. Uh, so really, they were focused on the speaking, but other people did write down what they said. And I read to you part of Gorgias's argument for his three denials. That, I read you part of his argument for his first denial, in fact. So here's his first denial. Gorgias, Gorgias says, first of all, this is quite unfortunate if he's right, nothing exists. And the funny thing here is, he's kind of making fun of Parmenides with this, because Parmenides thought he was being as profound as you could be by saying, being is, becoming is not. Gorgias comes and says, not even being is. Nothing is. Uh, which is obviously even more radical than Parmenides. But he's hedging his bets. As you've noticed, there's three denials. And you might wonder, if nothing exists, why on earth would you bother denying anything else? You've denied everything you can deny if you deny that anything exists. Well, he's hedging his bets, as I said. He wants to convince people to not worry about the truth, even if they don't buy his first denial that nothing exists, which frankly I don't think anyone buys. He wants to say, all right, even if, I forgot my notes for his three denials, but I'm pretty sure I have them in my memory. Even if something exists, it cannot cannot be known. In other words, all right, there's nothing but guess what, second denial. Even if there was something, you can't know anything about it. So don't bother trying to know anything about anything. Because first of all, there is nothing, and even if there was, you couldn't know anything about it. But he's not done hedging his bets, because he knows that some people won't buy even that, so he's got a third denial. Even if something exists and can be known, It cannot be, what do you suppose? Remember, his goal here, he wants to dismiss the chains of the truths discovered by philosophy being foisted on people to make them good. So that nothing exists. Even if something exists, you can't know anything about it. But OK, sir, even if you do, even if something does exist and you did somehow discover something about it, Keep it to yourself, because it cannot be, yeah, it cannot be communicated. Even if somehow there was something, and even if somehow that something could be known about, you could never possibly communicate your knowledge of that something to anybody else, so don't bother. In other words, Socrates, give up. Okay. This is his famous threefold denial, and this denial encompasses three of the main branches of philosophy, if not the main, the, if not the three main branches of philosophy. And we'll also want this down. You can just maybe write these words, squeeze them in somewhere next to each denial. The first denial, nothing exists. This denial relates to metaphysics. This is a metaphysical denial.
The second denial, we will erase the quiz reminder here, but I'm sure you all remember. Second denial relates to what is called epistemology. Epistemology is the philosophy of human knowledge. Metaphysics directly asks the most fundamental questions possible. But not much less fundamental than the questions themselves are the questions of how do we know that we know, and how do we know when we know, and how do we know um, when we know something for sure. That's a whole field of philosophy, because we want to not just have knowledge, we want to feel certain about the knowledge that we have, otherwise it's not too useful. So uh, Gorgias is completely rejecting the whole field of epistemology with that. And then there's no fancy name for number three, this is just philosophy of language, or we can just call it language. It's a denial of language. Philosophy of language is also a huge division of philosophy. Linguistics is sometimes studied separate from philosophy, but um, it's certainly a field within philosophy as well. So he's denying everything he can possibly think of to deny here. And again, I read, you, read to you before the break a brief passage of how he goes about denying being. Kind of important that we believe something exists. So how on earth are we going to refute Gorgias? Well, um, let's take a stab at it. I'm not so sure there's any way to directly refute his first denial, because existence is the ultimate presupposition. Um, at some point, something must be taken for granted. And if anything is ever going to be taken for granted, it is existence. So it's not so, I don't even know if there's much of a point in trying to directly refute what his first denial is saying literally, but more likely someone who would proffer this first denial is espousing a philosophy where, sure, there's, quote, something, but it's all just uh, illusion. And that's more popular than just flat out denying existence, is to say that everything that we suppose is real is just an illusion. So that's, I think, worth some, a little bit of effort at least to address. Because, you know, it's funny, half the time people ask me what I do and I say I teach philosophy, they, they say, oh man, well, I remember back one day I was thinking, how do I know this is all not just a, Imagination, dream, everybody's thought at some point, how do we know we're not just dreaming? How do we know everything isn't just a dream? Well, first of all, we just know it isn't, so get real. But that's OK. We can philosophize about this a bit. Um, we have this thing called perception. Obviously, we are perceiving things. No one denies that he is perceiving things. The question is, is, that, is your perception linked to reality that is the cause of perception through the mediation of the senses? Or is that perception somehow not linked to an objective reality from which it proceeds? Is it instead linked to some other cause? And that cause is chalked up to multiple things. Maybe a dream, maybe a simulation, maybe it's just random, maybe, it isn't, maybe it's causeless. And I gave away the answer to the question I was going to ask. Maybe someone would reject the need to even attribute a cause to our perception. To say that something is without cause is to say that it is what? Another R word? Without, or that it is, yeah, without reason, definitely. If something is completely causeless, you would call it, maybe, what's that? Natural? Oh, okay. That would have a different type of cause, certainly, than we, than we would think of. Let me, um, so your, stat, your, your, your TV is, goodness, dating. I haven't had a TV in well over a decade. Um, do, do TVs still have static? Is there, is there static on TV still? Do you turn on it? You know, anyway, the, what a given pixel does having static, you say, ah, I don't need to ponder the cause of that because it's, yeah, or pointless, yeah, random. When we, to, to, assert the, to, to, to 
attribute randomness to something is to attribute a lack of causality to it. And that's fair enough. If something's really random, you don't need to bother pondering its cause because it's random. And you certain, I sure hope you, you don't uh, waste too much time pondering the cause of a random thing. Um, please don't determine what to do with your life by what a magic eight ball tells you to do, because it's what? <laughs> random. But here's the thing with randomness. It presents enormous philosophical problems. Because guess what? There's no such thing. Um, I'm not saying go with a magic eight ball. That's not what I mean. Don't do that. But still, there is no such thing as randomness. Um, you might dispute this because you could hop in your computer right now and say, give me a random number, and it would oblige. You could hop in Excel, and it would do so. Sorry, it needs to be. Oh, yeah, statistics relies on randomness, and that's the irony of statistics. Yeah. It is not an ontological study. It, it re you see randomness really random. Exactly. So, yeah, that's amazing. That's, you see, for every study, there is the philosophy, for every science, there is the philosophy of blank. And if you neglect the philosophy of something, you might forget what's directing it in the first place, and that's a quintessential example. Um, but rand so, and I'll just continue real quick with that example. Like you could hop on Excel right now. I'm sure your Google could probably do it. I'm sure your phone can do it. And you could demand that it give you a random number, and it would give up a random number, a, a random number. How does it do that? How does it know which one to pick? It's got an algorithm. But what's an algorithm? An equation, a simple mathematical equation. And what's the problem with equations? Every single time you use them, they do what? The exact same thing every single time, no matter what. So how on earth does your computer give you a random number? Like, let me, can, can you give me a random number, 1 through 10? 6. 6. You just did, in a second, what the most advanced artificial intelligence computer in the world cannot do. And you all are capable of that, because you're all much smarter than, by far, than, than the best supercomputer in the world. Um, although not due to your ability to pick a random number, that's another point. How on earth does your computer give you a random number? If, if an algorithm won't work, uh, like you could say, well, pick, it's got a bunch of numbers and it's hard to have it picks one. Well, yes, it does. How does it choose which one to pick? How does it make that choice randomly when it's incapable of doing anything but doing what the algorithm tells it to do? Your whole computer is just a bunch of ones and zeros, a bunch of binary equations. Well, here's what it does. Every time you ask your computer for a random number, it's as if I look at my watch, look at the second hand, and say eight, because it's pointing at the eight. All your computer does anytime you ask for a random number is it tells you the time. It appears random. Why? Because your computer has a clock that goes down to like the billionth of a second. And it just takes whatever digits are in this ridiculously precise part of its clock. And for all intents and purposes, you're never going to have a pattern underlie the choice of a number in such a uh, detailed part of the clock's digits. So for all intents and purposes, it works as a random number. Is it random? Not at all. It just told you the time. No computer can do something as simple as pick a random number. Um, there's all sorts of other methods of random number generation, but if you look into them all, none of them are random. They try to, uh, another method of random number generation is to hook up your computer to a weather sensor and harvest wind speed and humidity data and feed that through an algorithm. Is that random? No, just, just check the weather. We can't. So moral of the story is this. Randomness cannot explain anything because it's not an ontologically valid, it's not an ontologically real phenomenon. Ontologically meaning relating to being. And by the way, don't worry, I'm not going to test you guys in this. I'll just give you a hint right now. I'm not going to ask you to refute Gorgias in the final. You'll be, you'll be in good shape as long as you have his denials down. Um, but I want to at least run through just a few things real quick. I'm going to try to step up the pace here. So we can't defer. 
yes, there is obviously apparent randomness. The whole field of statistics needs it. Um, the, uh, the, we use random numbers all the time, and they work perfectly fine because they have sufficient apparent randomness to them. You know, the quintessential way of choosing a random number if you're playing a game is what? Roll the dice. How does that choose a random number? It's not random at all. It's absolutely determined the, the second it leaves your fingers by Newton's laws, which uh, side will be up. You just can't predict it, so it works as a random number. Um, but we can't actually defer to randomness to explain any phenomenon because it's not a real phenomenon. It's an apparent phenomenon. And the whole point of philosophy is to rise above the seams to the is itself. If we're trying to discover the is and not just reside in the realm of the seams, we sure as heck better not appeal to a seams in order to answer the very questions we have in that undertaking. That would be a bit self-defeating. So we need, we all know we have a perception, and we are stuck needing to attribute a cause to it. We are stuck needing to acknowledge that something is causing this incredible amount of perception that we are basking in every moment of our waking lives. What is causing that? Well, what's causing it in a dream? Firing at things that are already where? They're already there. You don't actually just. Sure, dreams can be incredibly weird, like really weird, and, and they, they obviously aren't mere recollections of events that you've been to, but they're just this messed up combination of stuff you remember and maybe a little bit of your reason mixed in with it, a little bit of your imagination mixed in, depending upon how deeply asleep you are. And I'm not a psychologist. I'm, I'm sure they could go on and on about the details of how dreams work. But the point is, philosophically, the cause of everything in a dream is everything that was already where? In your mind. And where'd that come from? <laughs> Reality. So. There's no real way to argue that everything could be a dream because then what fed your very dreams the stuff that they need to formulate in the first place? Secondly, in a dream you can't discover things. You can seem to discover a few things. And if you did discover something in a dream, then what you're saying is that was a divine revelation. And I'm not against that. But if you're going to go asserting a divine revelation, you're certainly not going to try to, divide, to deny existence itself. Um, so I'll just leave that aside. Um, we don't discover things in our dreams because the very source material of our dreams is what we already knew. And yet, right now, you could prove that you're not dreaming. Why? Or how? Not by pinching yourself. You can feel pain in a dream. That wouldn't work. You could learn something new right now. You could discover something completely beyond anything that has ever entered your brain before just by observing reality. And I always. I bought this cheap microscope for my son, and I always mean to bring it into this class when we talk about this, and I forget every, every year. Why do you suppose I want to bring a microscope to this class? You know, you could argue, I already know all this stuff about ugly concrete blocks and ugly plastic desks and ugly, man, this is an ugly room. Um, but what if I brought a leaf in, and, and you, uh, you definitely knew nothing about the cellular structure of a leaf? What could you do in reality? Yeah, you could understand. You could actually discover truths about the cellular structure of a leaf without anybody telling it to you just by your own investigation of reality. That is knowledge that is vastly beyond, again, if you, if you know that you don't have this knowledge already, vastly beyond anything that you already had. So how could you be dreaming if, you can, if reality itself contains a reservoir of things vastly beyond your intellect, vastly beyond your memory? You can discover. Um, and the same argument works pretty well for saying this couldn't be a simulation. I mean, I could pick one little piece of dirt off of this table and put it under a bit of a better microscope. And the amount of data I could mine from this I really shouldn't pick up random pieces of dirt in this room. I have no idea what I'm touching right now. Um, <laughs> But whatever that was, now I don't want to know what it was, but I could mine exabytes of data out of that with a good enough microscope. And, and like an exabyte is a unit of data that we can't even fathom. Like nothing can store, no computer on Earth can store an exabyte. Um, that's just one little speck. You could do that with every little speck of stuff anywhere in the world. Uh, 
There is no theoretical quantum computer that could store the amount of data that reality itself has inherent in its very structure. Not even in a theoretical science fiction novel. There is no way. Uh, because, and this is actually a philosophical, metaphysical, pre-scientific axiom, the perfect knowledge of a thing is none other than the thing itself. You know, I could, you can have a decent knowledge of this circle, this quote circle that I'm not very good at drawing, by knowing its radius. If this radius is like five inches, then you say, okay, the circle radius five inches. Does that give you perfect knowledge of this circle? No, it'd be really easy to store that data. Circle, radius five inches, centered right here. There is so much more about this lame excuse for a circle that I just drew. I mean, the amount of details everywhere, are the, the only way you could actually store every single solitary truth about this circle is by just having this circle itself. But this is one of the reasons why it doesn't matter how well we've digitized our important historical documents. It's very important that we what? preserve the actual things. Because we can never be sure that we know every single thing there is to know about a document just because we've digitized certain elements of its, of its structure. Yeah, I think so. A picture does a much better job. Cap even a picture, of course, is data, and it's very imperfect. But it still does a lot more than purely quantitative description, definitely. So you can't even have the totality of a thing by having data about it. You can only have the totality of a thing by having the totality of the thing. Because perfect knowledge of a thing is none other than the thing itself. Important philosophical axiom there. Um, so we can't really, there's really nothing that we can ascribe our perception to other than the, frankly, common sense view that we are perceiving because there's a reality and we happen to have these great things called senses that are linked to reality. And we are actually discovering things about reality every time we perceive it. So there's existence. OK. 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Even if something exists, it cannot be known. Um, subjectivism. That, I don't know. It's kind of hard to categorize each of these denials according to an ism. But we also need to address this kind of general notion that knowledge is pure that knowledge is purely subjective that when you know something it is simply your knowledge and that it is not linked to objective reality we must in other words be can, I shouldn't say in other words but one way of looking at how we can address this is a matter of consistency um, Relating this to Protagoras, saying whatever a person perceives is also securely true. The question of seems versus is, there's a few different ways of addressing this. Let me erase these things that I just drew. So philosophy acknowledges there is a seems, and this is frankly what just about everybody does, it acknowledges there is a seems, acknowledges that there is an is, and strives to what? Use what's in the seams to rise above it to know what is. During the semester, I often see a car in the faculty lot. I don't know whose it is. Maybe it's another philosophy teacher. There's not many, but uh, it says, nothing is as it seems, but everything gives a clue. That's fair enough. Because we all know that appearances can be deceiving. But by merely saying that appearances can be deceiving, we are presupposing what? There are some that are not. Yeah. If something is deceiving, then it is saying what in contradiction to what? It's saying that something is one way when in reality it's another way. That's what it means to say that something is deceiving. So if something is, if it's even possible for something to be deceiving, that means that there must be a reality that it contradicts. So if we are ever going to say that anybody has been deceived, what have we just implicitly said? That there is a what? There is a truth, there is an objective reality that in that particular case, that person failed to accurately grasp. And we all know this happens all the time. 
But if there is only perception, a subjectivist, a Gorgias here, and a Protagoras would say, there is only a seems. Don't bother trying to rise to the truth because there isn't an is in the first place. Um, there's only a seems. So that's, what it, that's all there is. You don't need to bother worrying about it. So if you are at a bar with your friend, and your friend has unfortunately had too much to drink and says, uh, the room is spinning, if you're gorgeous, you have to say, yes, it is. Perception is reality. There is no is. There's only a seems. The room is spinning for you. Everything's fine. Keep drinking. <laughs> Please don't ever say that to someone who says the room is spinning because they drank too much. Tell them you are wrong because there is a reality. You are, I mean, you probably don't want to go through this with them, but you could. There is a reality. There is an objective reality. Our senses usually grasp it. But yours are not grasping that objective reality right now. They are twisted because of a bad choice you made. And they are failing to grasp the is. So you need to uh, go sleep somewhere safe, maybe, and don't drive. Um, because, of course, there's an is, and sometimes the seems contradicts it. If Gorgias is right that there's only a seems, if Protagoras is right that there's only a seems, we have to uh, unlock all of the mental, all of the insane asylums. Why? They're all right. There are blue bunny rabbits viciously attacking them everywhere they go that they need to have a big gun on them to prevent to guard against. Like, there are like all of these reincarnated Elvises everywhere. That, like, like, all these things are true if everything that every insane, insane person says. To merely acknowledge the existence of insanity is to acknowledge that there is a seems, there is an is, and sometimes, unfortunately, they don't correlate. Um, Clearly, to be consistent, we must reject Gorgias here. If we've ever been accused of a crime, we can't even defend ourselves and say, no, we didn't do that. Because if the accuser thinks we did, then we did. And that's all there is to it. So we, we must reject relativism. We must reject subjectivism. But I want to take, just like I did with relativism, I want to spend our last minutes here um, taking a look at another common phrase that seeks to espouse subjectivism. And again, you don't need this one in your notes either. Uh, I, technically, you don't need anything for that last question there, because I know this is confusing, and I'm not going to uh, demand that you have it mastered. But one more thing I want to run through is this. I mean, just with those three words. Does anyone know what I'm going to write next? If a tree falls in a forest with no one around to hear it, does it make a sound? Now, this is a question, so technically it asserts nothing. But it is intended to be a provocative and subtle assertion of subjectivism, hoping that some people, upon pondering the question, will answer no. Now, most people answer this quite reasonably when they're asked it. Most people, when they're asked this question, will answer exactly how they should. They'll say, if by sound you mean it objectively speaking, vibrates the air around it, then yes, it makes a sound. If by sound you mean uh, something is received by a human eardrum, then no. And that's a perfectly fine answer. But that's not what the question is getting at. The, well, the question, what this, whoever first came up with this is getting at, is to implicitly say that the mere fact that it wasn't perceived means that it didn't even happen. Because there is only a seems. And if there isn't something for a given seems, this is big with Protagoras, by the way, maybe even bigger with Gorgias. If there isn't a given perception for that seems to inhere in, then it doesn't exist at all. Only that which is perceived is at all in any way. That's subjectivism. So you often hear, I mean, a more common phrase is perception is reality which is obviously not true in as much as we've refuted subjectivism. 
perception is reality, as I said before, as with most ver fairly vague proverbs, it can be interpreted in a way that makes that's at least useful. But in and of itself, it's garbage, and it's often used to justify pretty horrendous things, most commonly in the stock market. That's a big phrase in stock trading. Perception is reality. It used to be, at least. Meaning, all that matters in the market is what people perceive the value of a company to be. That is the sole thing that determines its worth. That is the sole thing that determines anything in the market. The perception of uh, the people in the market. So who cares if the stock market's value has, in, in dollars has vastly uh, grown beyond the actual objective, calculatable value of the companies it represents? It's all perception. Let it keep growing and let these rich people get even richer. Well, what's going to happen if that perception is reality mindset continues to be followed? What happened in 2008? <laughs> Crashes and burns, because perception is not necessarily reality. Perception, hopefully, the job of perception is to be linked to reality. But if we delude ourselves into supposing that it uh, is guaranteed to do that, then we're always going to fall victim to horrible things like that. No, perception is not reality. Reality is reality. Perception should try its best to ascertain it. So how does, what does this have to do with trees and forests? Well, um, when we were addressing relativism, we were able to slightly rephrase the assertion of relativism to draw out the inherent contradiction within it. And this is a very important approach in philosophy. Whenever you can slightly reword something fairly, honestly, without changing its meaning, without rendering, without giving it a logically distinct meaning, whenever you can do that and in so doing reveal a contradiction, what you've done is you've just refuted that philosophy because you've shown that a contradiction is inherent in its design. Uh, you have to be careful not to be deceptive about that. You've got to be very honest in how you reword something to make sure you're not reading an error into it that isn't there. So a contradiction can never be asserted. We know that. But the converse is also true. A contradiction can never be asserted, and a blank can never be denied. Now, you might say that the obvious thing to put in there is a truth. And yes, certainly a truth must never be denied. But the whole problem here is sometimes it's hard to figure out what the truth is. When is something so true that it's barely even worth saying? It has another name. A contradiction is something that's so obviously wrong, we must never assert it. So it's not even worth saying most of the time. But the opposite of that, there's something that's the opposite of that. It's true, yes, but it's because it's such an obvious truth, it's usually not worth saying, and we have another word for it. What's that? Con certainly, it would certainly be common sense, yes. Fact, yeah, but unfortunately people tend to deny those. <laughs> Truism. Or also known as a tautology. Here's an example of a truism. A is A. They're essentially just redundant statements. They're not really worth saying because they're so obviously true. So what am I getting at here? Well, just like relativism could be slightly reworded without changing its meaning at all to reveal its inherent contradiction, so this statement can be slightly reworded to reveal that it is intrinsically an implicit truism. Now, this refutes subjectivism because to merely ask if a tree falls in a forest with no one around to hear it doesn't make a sound, to merely ask that question has what assumption built into it? That a tree fell in the forest with no one around to hear it. And yet the question itself, if it is slyly asked by subjectivists intending to deny that it happened, has just assumed that it happened in trying to deny that it happened. In other words, I don't want it to take too long to write on the board, so I'm not going to bother. I could simply rewrite this question without really changing its logical meaning as this. If a tree falls in the forest with no one around to hear it, 
does a tree fall in the forest with no one around to hear it? It doesn't take a super intelligent person to answer that question, yes. <laughs> the answer is simply yes. Why? Because any truism is always obviously valid, and it doesn't even need to be thought about. If A, comma A, you don't need to know anything about the content of what is put in there, the answer is always yes. In other words, subjectivism is attempted to be asserted by this question being answered no, but it is categorically impossible to answer this question in any way other than yes. And I think that's the, logic, the best logical way to address subjectivism, even if the other things we talked about might be a little more useful, maybe easier to remember. There was somebody who took Gorgias so seriously. Gorgias himself was quite a hypocrite with his denials because he kept on talking. But there was an ancient Greek by the name of Cratylus who became so convinced by Gorgias that he really, yeah, I guess nothing exists. I guess we can't know about it. I guess we can't communicate it. So he stopped talking. All he would do is move his finger. Of course, by moving his finger around, he was just what? Communicating very mundanely, because I don't think they even had sign language back then. He wasn't next door here in sign language class. So there's just no way of getting around needing to reject uh, Gorgias and Protagoras' assertions. 